Now I would like to invite Natalia Litovchenko. Natalia Litovchenko and Leonid Marushak. Leonid uh, is a researcher of the 20th century cultural heritage, and he is the um, initiator of the initiative called Denede. Mr. Litovchenko was one of the official artists in Pripyat. Natalia Litovchenko is the honorable artist of Ukraine. She's one of the experts who can tell us about those mosaics that we have in Pripyat. And Leonid can tell a bit more about their importance and about the importance of uh, ma maintaining cultural ha cultural heritage. I know this movement is getting more active in Ukraine. I'm so happy about this. And here is a great opportunity and a chance to present all this. Sorry, I turned on, switched off my mic. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. It is on. Yes, we can hear you. Good afternoon, dear friends. I'm a daughter of uh, Ivan Litovchenko. Uh, I was there when this work had started in Pripyat in 1974. M my father was the main artist of that facility. And he maintained all that order as an idea to create the new environment, the new city, the new town, the town for young scholars, young developers. And that town was really young. There were a lot of children in the squares, young families. And my father's artwork, the, the, he had general solutions for the entire city. So he actually came, kept in mind the entire concept. There was a big Lenin street and a big square. And there were mosaics, 100, 100 meters long, and there were a lot of know-hows. And some of the interesting materials were used. Uh, he just uh, didn't want to use uh, one single reliefs, but he wanted to actually use diversity of them to to have different colors. So there was one lighting in the evening, different lighting in the morning. In the sun, it looked absolutely different. And um, in the shadow areas um, that were looking like artworks, in the shadows, there were multicolor smalls. I mean, small toes. Uh, there was a lot of art in there. And it's very interesting when those creative works were were built, it was a red hot summer. We never saw our father from March till October. And the last works he did all by his by himself. He actually built those 100 meter long reliefs. He, he was actually, he had no time to even have food. He, he had no time to eat because it was an idea to create the, the town. And there are very uh, interesting expositions. Um, he actually tried to grasp the whole essence. He went down to the reactor when it was disactivated. He had to study everything that he had worked with. And he could feel what could happen, that the disaster could happen. And they took place back in 2082. There was one incident, and not, not a single one, of a smaller scale, of course, but there had been incidents before that. We were talking to the city mayor. We visited his home, and he visited our house. And because um, our my father was a chief artist, he knew the director of the NPP, Mr. Bruhanov, and um, there is even uh, his tapestry dedicated to Mr. Bruhano with his image on it. It all started with the music and the energy of the composition. I 
I was a student those days and we were actually climbing all the way upstairs and those steel things were so hot so they when when they passed the bucket of water there upstairs because of the steel it was so hot the temperature went so high that the water literally boiled so the idea was to build a brand new town it was the first ever experience in the Soviet Union. Some artists had started working on the comprehensive solutions for the facility, but he tried to actually engage different color solutions and he never allowed to publish anything because he wanted to finish everything. There was a general color solution in there. This was a growing thing all the way to the center where there's Prometheus sculpture. All those tours were turned to the light and in the end energy comes closer to the reactor site all that is being destroyed right now and it's i feel very sorry that some of those side walls uh, are being destroyed because the small toe is falling apart and some of those side walls have no small toe on it if the state wants to actually do something about it first of all maybe some of those things can be closed by the glass you can see those pictures here because those works are quite unique uh, there was nothing like this anywhere else and they're very strong you know my father you can recognize his work because those are different from anyone else's you can see this co composition is called music And we can see the organ when we look at this composition, and this design. Parts of those are being destroyed, so there is no the small, small toe, small toe for an, falling, falling apart. The metal works. You can see those people running away. People keep asking, "How did you know the disaster would happen?" that people will be escaping. And everybody was so scared of this peaceful Adam. Adam. So uh, uh, indeed, um, the artists can feel something. They He even said that there was something horrible about this place. There was a lot of tragedy in all those works because for the 10 years anniversary, he created the one called Requiem. And a month after this, this tapestry was given to a way to, for the exhibition, my father died. And my father wasn't sick, he wasn't ill, but people say that one should not create anything called Requiem because that's what Mozart did and he then died and my father did as well. You can see some of the options of those artworks. He was always combining the right side with the left side. So he was making a lot of experiments, as you can see. But I'm sure those works have to be preserved. That's a key idea behind it. And this is the core point that I wanted to express. Just right after our meeting, I, wa I visited the Chernobyl site and I managed to walk right very close uh, along the Lenin Street, I could, so I could see those mosaics. Only one piece uh, remains to be in good condition. All, all the others are, are so poor. I saw one of them where you can only see one third of that. All things fall apart. You can see the, the bare bricks over there. Leonid can tell us more about the mosaics, how they much they are important even though they come from the soviet union times and why why do they have to be protected why is this should why should this be considered part of our historic heritage well when we talk about the mosaics there in chernobyl versus the others in you in the other sites and locations in ukraine to me personally this is the monumental soviet ukrainian art we have a major problem that until now there was not a single conference that could help us finally give a proper definition to these artworks. 
what people normally hate is the word uh, Soviet, because people stigmatize anything that starts with the word Soviet. But without exaggeration, that is still a Ukrainian masterpiece. The mosaic practices have not been developed in the Soviet time. They had been developed well before, but they flourished during the USSR. And maybe thanks, first of all, to Ivan Litovchenko, who was one of the founders of this titanic artwork and craftsmanship that very few people are capable of. Even to restore that, there are very few examples that have shown to us that that's really complex and expensive, and it takes a lot of time. If you want to talk about the value of those mosaics in Chernobyl, thanks to those mosaics and thanks to the works of Ivan Litovchenko, we could create a visual image to the city because the town was built in this epoch of modernism, which suffered a lot from very typical and sim same looking projects. Those were designed by different design bureaus in Kiev, Kharkiv and Moscow. They were normally designing buildings for those uh, bedroom communities. But in order not to, for the cities not to look the same, they used those mosaics as practices. This titanic effort by Ivan Litochenko, who on his own, like Svetlana just mentioned, created those side walls, 100 up to 100 meters long. long. They were first made of concrete and then decorated uh, with smalto and other materials. And that was handled by one person. Of course, there were people to help, but he was in charge. To actually give a flavor, give certain flavor to those towns and cities in a public space. Unfortunately, those places are suffering most of all just because they're in public space and they survive in aggressive environment because they're Soviet. Can I add something? Of course, I started from Pripyat, from Chernobyl, but I never mentioned a prelude. My father had been one of the founders of this monumental art. And in 1961, he decorated the river port in Kiev with the mosaic mosaics. Yes, we told a little bit about it, Back in 2019, we had the Chernobyl movie series from my HBO, and we also finally opened the river port. We also mentioned, but apart from uh, the Riverside station, uh, he also uh, decorated some of the facilities and sites in uh, the Victory Square uh, next to Shulavska metro station. He also uh, created some of the artworks. Uh, there was no small toe over there, but he was using something else. He also used some tiles over there. Yes, after a couple of days when we talked, uh, I, I visited those places. I just wanted to come back to the Riverside Station because uh, the, there were also um, some of those masterpieces were still available, but already in 2019, some of the, some of the others were destroyed. Well, actually, when that facility was built in 1961, we had visitors from Bulgaria, from Germany, from Tretyakov Gallery, Mr. Korolev from Russia. They were all so much impressed that Ukraine produces so much innovation. Ukraine was head and shoulders above in all the artworks in those times. Uh, my father was the only one recommended by the artist journal in USSR. He was very progressive. He started with the train station in Kiev, where he decorated some of the walls. Then after I actually decorated another, another premises right there at the central Kiev. 
uh, train station. My father could also work following the traditional Soviet style and live a great life, shake hands of ministers, but he wanted to be innovative because it was time of Khrushchev. Um, there was like a Khrushchev thaw. We had impressionists. There were Ligiers, uh, Liget and Picasso, all those things uh, people had never seen before. And all of a sudden, because of the Khrushchev's thaw, people started seeing Liget and then uh, well, they discovered Wojciech. Well, some of those were still covered with paint in the 80s. Some of those side walls were actually covered with paint, not to show the masterpieces by Bojak. When they renovated the building, they just covered the frescoes with plaster and, and paint. Of course, it was difficult. Uh, the mission was hard. It's always difficult to push something through when there is something brand new. There is always resistance and there is a lot of persecution. The commission from the uh, People's Commissariat of the party, well, they arrived to the Chernobyl site and they say those artworks, they totally plunge uh, the Soviet Union's history. That's not something what we have to, we need to have. But he was always, um, driven by his own ideas. Uh, but my father was the go-getter. He decided on the design. He made decisions on what has to be done. Yes, I want to add something. Architects could not dare practicing whatever they wanted. When new towns and cities were designed, everything was strictly regulated. There were instructions about using designs like this and paint like this and colors like this, but the monumentalists were allowed doing some, doing whatever they wanted, almost that. There were, that had to do with the artists and architects. And then in cooperation, they together designed buildings given um, the facilities that were their size and the quality of that, that helped decorate buildings and create new standing and visualization of the cities and towns. It's not only about one single artist who tried to create something brand new. No, that process used to be very complicated. And thanks to that, there was an, an opportunity to do something brand new. And unfortunately, the attitude, the contemporary attitude to such facilities, it's just ne negligence. And unfortunately, it annihilates all those values. Instead of being proud and to demonstrate that era by showing the, the same mosaics, by rest, renovating them, by restoring them, we could do that. But unfortunately, that is not being done. That's the whole story of that town. The town used to be there. There was a lot of studies behind it. Sometimes all those material decoration materials uh, put on the facades can be actually considered very rough and rigid, but that's actually the story uh, behind it. We have one practical question. Can you recommend the most efficient technology of how to renovate and restore those mosaics? Is there anything that can be do about this? Right now, I'm restoring one wall of the crematorium. Like they restore some of the patchworks and mosaics in Europe. Some of the things that are now completely destroyed, I do not even know how to restore them. I mean, those things that are destroyed, they, they need to actually be restored from scratch. Maybe with a modern technology that can be done much easier, but there is no small toe. The small toe is just um, something that was produced by the factory in Lysychansk. It's no longer available. It's the Luhansk People's Republic right now, the so-called one. But the Italian small toe is really important. 
There is no factory anymore. And also the Kiev glass factory used to produce smalto. So it's not operational anymore. At least we could actually uh, restore those things that are now in desperate, desperate condition for the walls not to be destroyed anymore. What about technology, technologies like laser screening and uh, have the di digital prints? In Chernobyl or Pripyat that is uh, being destroyed, the city looks like jungles, no more like a town. And there is an attitude, one attitude is to do nothing, let the nature eat it all, and we just will continue seeing the pictures about them. Or there is a different opinion, like we need to restore everything for that to be a real tourist attraction and are good memorial sites. Between those two opinions, um, in the decision-making process for some of the public institutions, there is no consensus yet. And just recently I had information that maybe we should keep it as it is and only we should restore some of those buildings, not even restoring them, not renovating them, but just let them stay as they are. If there is something falling apart, put it down. That's it. I have a question to you. Is there any efficient digital technology of how to best preserve cultural heritage sites? Cult cultural heritage sites. Well, the walls can be reinforced for them not to destroy anymore. This is the only way possible. What, did, what about the digital scanning technology? Or you believe this is something irrelevant or let it, let it fall down? I do not even know, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, this question is indeed very relevant. It has to do with all the, with all the different sites, because it's not the only town that is suffering. I'm not talking about cities and towns. I'm talking about the different facilities based in different towns and cities. This year, it is the 35th anniversary of um, the disaster. And they wanted to actually make the Duga Raider as a memorial site, but we do not have any definition of the memorial site even in our legislation. So there is no official definition given. Can we do that on the Chernobyl site? We need to have the political and scientific consensus. If we're inclined to think that let the nature stay where, where it is, because it was the man-made man -made disaster and let the nature recover everything. If we want though, to maintain those areas as tourist destination, destinations, then we need to decide what can be done about this. We're now talking about the we're now talking about the values of those facilities and sites. We are the descendants who appreciate all those sites. We, we can't let it be destroyed by itself over time. If you ask myself, then I would say everything has to be documented in order to analyze how it looked like in the past, how it looks like now, and how it's gonna look like in the future. Secondly, at least the minimum response works have to be provided and carried out, at least because there are tourists in there. None less important it is to appreciate the value of those sites and facilities. Uh, there are no, uh, no more mosaics and patchwork um, panels and boards and pictures. We, ha we can make those sites really great historic destinations. So we need to discuss that in the broad circle of scholars and experts. We need to maintain those and preserve them. Thank you very much for your participation. Hopefully we will be able to uh, make great conclusions from our conversation and have them implemented into our exclusion zone strategy. Thank you, thank you very much.